Well, hey, good morning, City Light Church. My name is Jonathan Randall. I'm one of the guys on staff. It's good to be with you this morning. Hey, before we jump into uh, our message today, can we just celebrate? Can we thank God for all that he did last week? I mean, 68 people got baptized, y'all. That's crazy. 68 people declared that they now belong to Jesus, that their old way of life is over, that their new life is in Christ has now begun. Man, if that doesn't get you excited, if that doesn't make you want to say amen, like, I don't know what will. Like, we have coffee and donuts in the back, but you might just need some straight-up sugar this morning, something to get going. Well, hey, if you've got your Bibles, uh, open them up to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. Today, we finish up our sermon series in the book of Acts, and I am excited to read God's Word with you this morning. Well, let me begin this way by stating that I think one of the greatest characteristics we need today is courage. We need real courage probably more than anything else. Let me provide you some examples of where I think we need courage most. We need the courage to finally admit that no one looks good in skinny jeans. Like, I know I'm wearing them, they're comfortable, but no one looks good in them. Like, we just need to have the courage to finally admit that. We need the courage to admit that Raisin Cane's has superior chicken to Chick-fil-A. I know Chick-fil-A is Christian chicken, Raisin Cane's is better. There's like a disagreement going on. I feel like Paul right here. Um, We need the courage to admit that I think secretly no one really likes what they are on the Enneagram. I know I don't. It's like, John, you're a three, wing four, which means you hate sunshine and rainbows and you love it when kids cry. It's like, thanks, Enneagram. I totally have so much courage to go out and face all of my life's problems. Um, But in all seriousness, I think we all need courage, right? I think, in fact, we all want courage. We want the courage to face all of life's hang-ups, problems, issues, and circumstances that are going to come our way, don't we? Don't we want courage to face an unknown or new career? Don't we want courage to face hardship or grief or failure? We want courage to face the current situation that we're in, maybe that's filled with conflict or boredom. And we're all staring ourselves in the mirror saying, if I just had the courage to face this, then I'd get through it. If I just had the courage. And this matters for all of us this morning, because the world has no shortage of options of where to get courage. The world, our culture right now, will tell you, hey, if you want courage, you just need to tell yourself you're not afraid. Just banish fear. Get rid of it. Tell yourself you're not afraid. But here's the problem with that. I've tried telling myself that I'm not scared of spiders, and then every time I see one, I scream like a 10-year-old girl. It just does not work. And then then there's this weird religious thing called the prosperity gospel, and it comes along and puts a spiritual spin on what the culture is saying, and it's saying, hey, if you have courage for God, then he will take away all your fears. He will give you ease and comfort and peace and get rid of your fears. But here's the problem with that. I know a lot of suffering Christians who are courageous but yet still terrified. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, right when he was about ready to go to the cross and die for our sins, The Bible says he was so scared, so terrified that he was sweating drops of blood. Like, do we not understand that courage does not exist without fears, right? If you're you're not afraid, you have no need for courage. Courage is taking action while still being afraid. Courage is having faith in spite of your fears. So if the world doesn't offer true courage... Where do we get it? I think we get it by looking into the scriptures and specifically our, into our text this morning. Let, us, let me catch us up uh, on leading up to Acts chapter 28. In the last part of the book of Acts, Paul is kind of done with these adventurous missionary journeys where he could kind of go wherever he wants, share the gospel, and plant churches. Now, Paul is under arrest. The Jews have accused him of insurrection in Roman courts, but the Romans can't find anything wrong with him, and so they don't know what to do with him. So they're like, well, we don't really want a riot or any of this stuff breaking out, so let's just throw Paul in prison. 
And Paul has to endure all of these unfair trials, trial after trial after trial, and he's forced to go to places that maybe he doesn't want to go. And during all these trials, Paul goes through the ringer. Like, at one time, he has 40 assassins after him. Like, 40 people want Paul dead. In fact, they're not going to eat until they have him killed. At one point, Paul gets thrown into a prison, and during the uh, change of leadership, he gets forgotten and left there because he simply won't bribe the warden to get out. Paul is mocked and beaten and called insane on numerous occasions during his trial. He gets shipwrecked on a way to another trial, almost dies at sea, gets washed up on shore, and while he's trying to make a fire to get warm from being in the ocean for like a week, a snake jumps out of the bush and bites him. Like, I think I have a bad day when my fridge runs out of LaCroix. And here's Paul is like, hold my drink, bro. I've got you beads. What is happening here at the end of the book of Acts? When you read all of this, it's like the momentum of Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3 just seems to kind of stall out. And, and the book takes this nosedive. And I'm sure that Paul must have been wondering, how do I have the courage to face all that I'm facing? Well, in Acts chapter 23, 11, Paul gets this wonderful promise while he's in prison. And it's actually the last words of Jesus in the book of Acts. And he appears to Paul in prison, and he says, The following night the Lord stood by him. That's Jesus standing by Paul. And he said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. In other words, Paul all the courage you need to face all that is coming your way is found in Jesus. Jesus is the one who's going to give you the courage to not only face what you are about ready to face, he's going to give you the courage to overcome it where the church is actually going to advance. The gospel is going to go forth. Jesus will give you the courage to face it head on. No matter what your fears are, no matter what hardships you face, Jesus has the courage for you, Paul. The good news this morning is we can have that courage too. We can have that courage too. As we come to Acts chapter 28, I think we see at least four reasons why Paul demonstrated this courage. And it's my hope and my prayer that as we leave this place, we learn from Paul and we take the courage that Jesus has to offer as well. So let's pick back up the text and read from Acts chapter 28, starting in verse 11. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the two twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There, we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So the first reason that I think we see in this text for Paul's courage that we can learn from is this. Take courage because God is faithful. Take courage because God is is faithful. In Acts chapter 23, 11, Jesus shows up to Paul in prison in Jerusalem and says, hey, take courage. Just as you've talked about me in Jerusalem, I'm going to get you to Rome, and you are going to talk about me there. And here we are. Years later, Paul is entering the city of Rome. It's not the journey he expected to take. I'm sure that he thought he was going to be broken out of prison and get there immediately, but Paul has to go through all of these hardships. But the point I want, to, I want us to see in the text is that God is faithful to his promise that Paul would get to Rome. And notice that the text says Paul specifically took courage, or some texts say he was encouraged when he saw the church come out to meet him. Now what's interesting about that is Paul had nothing to do with the church that was planted in Rome. These are Christians he has never met before. And the text says that they traveled some 40 miles south. When they got wind of Paul coming, they traveled 40 miles south to go and meet him. And Paul took courage. He was so encouraged by these believers coming to greet him that he entered Rome not as a worn out, beaten prisoner, but he entered as a courageous missionary. Still a prisoner, 
but ready to get after and continue what God had called them to do. In uh, 2015, I took like the worst road trip like known to man. It was a road trip from hell. I went from Colorado to Florida in the middle of the winter. Uh, I traveled through like 24 inches of snow in Colorado. When we got into Texas, I hit this winter storm called Goliath. That was like a mixture of blizzards and tornadoes. And then we get into the panhandle of Florida and we hit a deer. And at that point, I'm like, I'm done. Like vacation over. I am not driving the, the other eight hours we needed to go to get to my home. I was done with this trip. But in that moment, God began to remind me of his faithfulness. In that moment, God began to show me some encouragement. Uh, my my uh, insurance agent called me after he found out about the accident and said, hey, I'm going to go to bat with the mechanic. We're going to try to save your car so that you can get home with it. My mom called and was like, hey, what's your deductible? I want to pay it. The sheriff was like, hey, we're going to give you a free ride. We're going to hook you up and send you to the hotel. And as I arrived at the hotel, I just like sank into the bed and I was like, God, you're faithful. Like, you're faithful. And it, and it it encouraged me and it gave me the courage to get back in the car and finish the trip. Now, God didn't promise me, hey, John, I'm going to get you from Colorado to Florida. I don't have that promise. And likewise, we don't have Paul's promise. It's not like God's showing up to us in prison or our basement or something, and it's like, hey, just as you've testified about me in Omaha, I'm going to get you to Rome. It would be a wrong interpretation to say, hey, if you have courage for God, he will get you to your Rome, whatever that is. If you have courage, he'll give you a new spouse. If you have courage, you will get that new job or promotion. If you have courage, you'll even plan a successful church. Right? You can have all the courage in the world, and life can still go really badly. But here's the thing I want us to see, and hopefully it encourages us, is that no matter what you are facing, you can have all the courage because God is faithful. And he's faithful in at least two respects. Number one, he's faithful to always be with you. There's this promise at the end of the Gospels where Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's not just this trite statement where he's like, yeah, whenever you think about me, I'm kind of with you. No, in Acts, we find out that the promise of God's presence is literally now going to dwell in humanity. The Holy Spirit is going to be with us. Jesus was with Paul. He was with him on the trial and in the shipwreck and in the prison cell. Do you realize that promise still extends to us because God has given us the Holy Spirit? No matter what you are facing right now, you can have the courage to face it because God is in you through the Holy Spirit if you believe in Jesus. God's not up in heaven with his arms folded thinking like, well, go figure it out. Have courage. I hope it works out. No, God wants to actually be near to us. In fact, he not only wants to be so close to us, he wants to dwell in us through the Holy Spirit. And that presence and that faithfulness will never leave us. That should give us courage. He's also faithful to complete his mission of building the church and spreading the gospel. If you notice in verses 11 through 14, you get all this detail about all this traveling. It's like describing the ship and all these cities. And like, if you actually read the last like third of the book of Acts, like Luke goes into some like vivid descriptions about like the ocean and like cities and Paul's travel logs. And it's like, What are you doing, Luke? Like, why is this all in here? And I think what Luke is trying to do is he wants us, the reader, to realize that there is a passage of time going on here, that there is monotonous, boring days for Paul. Not everything that Paul experienced was this amazing on cloud nine all the time. And I think the reason he's doing that is because he wants us to emotionally feel that there is time passing by, but he wants to remind us that even, no matter how much time passes by, no matter how much boredom and monotonous goes on in our lives, God is still faithful to accomplish what he set out to do. And I think Paul encouraged, or uh, God encouraged Paul through a church that he didn't plant because he wanted to remind Paul to say, hey, Christianity doesn't rise and fall based on what you're doing, Paul. Christianity always advances because of God's faithfulness. The second reason Paul took courage that we can learn from is this. Take courage because of the hope in the resurrection. Take courage because of the hope 
in the resurrection. So picking back up the text, Acts chapter 28, verse 17. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So we can take courage because of the hope of the resurrection. In these verses, we actually see that uh, Paul is kind of recapping the whole plot line of what's going on here. Paul is basically saying, hey, I'm on a bogus trial. These Jewish people, they, they can't put pin anything on me. They, they say that I've done all these things, but none of it is true. And the Romans, they can't find anything wrong with me. And I don't have anything against either one of them. But if you notice in verse 20, Paul's so savvy. He goes, hey, let me tell you what this is actually really about. This is really about the hope of Israel. In other words, this is about my belief in the resurrection. This is about the hope that I have in the resurrection. See, uh, leading up to chapter 28, Paul goes through four different trials. And every trial like breaks out into pandemonium every time Paul brings up the resurrection. Now, Paul's not trying to defend his rights here. He's not like saying, hey, I shouldn't be persecuted because I believe in the resurrection. No, what Paul's actually doing, he's savvy. He's bringing up the resurrection so that he can evangelize and tell about the hope that he has in Jesus to these people. He's not trying to make a case for his freedom to believe in the resurrection. He's trying to say, hey, I'm appealing to Caesar so that Caesar knows that there is someone better who offers a better kind of freedom. His name is King Jesus. See, Paul, he's not trying to get out of the trial. He's trying to use it as an opportunity to share the gospel. He wants people to know, hey, I'm not on trial because of some philosophical misunderstanding that scholars debate. No, I'm on trial because I believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That didn't just happen in a corner. And if Jesus has really raised from the dead something 500 people said they saw at one time, then that absolutely changes everything for the Romans, for the Jews, and it's the reason Paul has Hope. Jesus has defeated our greatest enemies of Satan, sin, and death by rising from the dead. That means that every sad thing out there is going to come untrue. Every good thing that was lost is coming back. And Paul not only had the hope in that to be able to stand in an unfair trial, he wanted everyone that was in the courtroom to hear about the hope that he had in Jesus. And he had the courage to say something. City Light, does the hope of the resurrection give you courage like that? One of my greatest anxieties in life is getting a haircut. I don't know why. I'm irrational. I'm crazy. But for some reason, I just always think the barber is going to, like, shave my head. I don't know why. It just always comes into my head. Except for you, Justin Larson. I don't know where you're at, but he gave me this haircut. He's awesome. Um, anyways... I, I think it also doesn't help that I work at uh, City Light, where, like, our worship leaders, like, they just, like, roll out of bed and look like they're male models ready for the camera with their hair. Like, I just have hair envy, and so, like, I think I can never really get the haircut right. And, and Joe, I, I think I have the dreaded monk bald spot on the top. I, I think I'm headed towards uh, your territory here soon enough. <laughs> um, but here's the truth my mom told me about getting a haircut. If you don't like it, it grows back. If you don't like it, it grows back, right? Like, so that, all of a sudden, as a teenager, that gave me, like, super courage and confidence to just rock whatever haircut I got, even if it looked like I got in a fight with a weed whacker, because I knew that my hair was going to grow back. Now, that's silly. It's a dumb metaphor. 
But isn't it true in a similar manner, we can have courage in any situation in life because the resurrection of Jesus means that we get it all back. City Light, I don't know what you're facing today. Maybe you're in an unresolved situation like Paul. Maybe like Paul, you're in an unfair situation that is pushing against some of your freedoms. Maybe it just feels like everything's against you. Can I give you good news this morning? The hope of the resurrection is real. If you believe in Jesus Christ, that he lived the life that you could never live, that he died the death that you deserve, that he offers you a resurrection hope. He offers you a resurrection life that you can have right now, and you can have hope and courage to stand in any situation that life throws at you. You want to know why? Because the hope of the resurrection means that we get it all back. Our freedom from temptation, our friends and family who have died, our innocence and sense of joy and wonder that's not tainted by sin, Jesus has won it all back for us through the resurrection. Now, if you believe that, I implore you to head into your current situation in life right now, and I want you to pray this prayer. God, who is it that is around me that needs to hear about the hope of the resurrection? And would you give me courage to say something? And if you're asking, John, I'd have a lot more courage if I knew how to do that. I'm glad you asked. I want to be helpful this morning. Let me give you three quick things that I think Paul does in this text that will help us share our hope in the resurrection and say something courageously in these circumstances. Number one, have a time and a place. Notice that Paul arranged a specific time where he said, hey, let me tell you about what this is all about. Let me tell you about the hope that I have and resurrection. If you make a plan and you have a time and a place of where you're going to share the gospel, you're more than likely to follow through on it. And the person that you're sharing with is going to respect you because they know what the conversation is that they're walking into. Have a time, have a place, have a plan. Number two, tell your story. Notice that Paul doesn't just run into this conversation and start dropping a bunch of theology. He shares about his trial first before he shares the gospel. And he says, hey, I have a hope that you need to hear about that has given me hope in the midst of this trial. So, it's, so for you, City Light, share your story. How has Jesus been your hope in the current situation that you are in? And number three, use the Bible to share the gospel. Notice in verse 23, Paul uses the law and the prophets to show people who Jesus was. I used to think, I can't use the Bible to share the gospel with a non-believer. They're a non-believer. They don't believe in the Bible. But here's the, here's the thing that that did. It forced me to believe that everything was on me to say the right words in order to get someone to believe. It's like I believe that if I could just get the right argument out, then the person would believe. But isn't it true that it's not my words, it's not your words that cause someone to believe. It's the Holy Spirit's resurrection power words through God's word that can change someone's heart, that can breathe everlasting life into all the dead areas of their lives. If you need help using the Bible to share the hope of the resurrection, might I suggest that you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. Read through it with someone. Discuss that chapter. Use the Bible to share the gospel. Let's be people of courage who do not only place our hope in the resurrection, but share that hope with other people. The third reason Paul took courage is this. Take courage because the gospel is for all kinds of people. Take courage because the gospel is for all kinds of people. Picking back up the text in verse 24, it says this, And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have deceived, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. So we can take courage because the gospel is for all kinds of people. I intentionally broke the text here of how the people are responding to Paul's message because I want us to see that people always respond to the gospel message. 
In verse 24, it says that some people believed and some did not. This is always true. There will always be people who will reject the gospel, and there will always be people who will receive the gospel. But then this thing changes. It says, notice, or, or, uh, notice in verse 25, the whole thing ends in a disagreement. Paul quotes this prophecy from the book of Isaiah, and this sparks the whole disagreement, and everybody dissipates. And the prophecy was basically this, hey, the Jewish people aren't going to listen because of their unbelief, but the Gentiles, they will listen. Now, I don't think those who disagreed with Paul here were mad because Paul basically called them stubborn. I think they're mad because the, the blessing and the favor from God that the Jewish people thought they deserved was beginning to go to a people, the Gentiles, who did not deserve it. And that is why they are upset. Over and over through the book of Acts, we've seen this theme that the gospel is for anyone who would believe. It's for all kinds of people, no matter your ethnic background, your social status, or your credit score, whether you're an insider, whether you're an outsider, you can be a Christian if you believe. And yet, there are some who say, yeah, Jesus is the Savior of the world, but he's not for those people. And that's what the Jews are doing here. Tragically, this still goes on today. I know this because I'm one of those people. There are days and moments where I struggle to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world for all people. There are days where I think, ah, yeah, he's the Savior of the world, but he's not the Savior of those progressive liberal, liberal Christians over there. He's not the Savior of those backwoods fundamental Christians over there. Those guys, those camps have bad theology, so Jesus isn't for them. It's almost as if I believe that, yeah, Jesus atones for all sins except the sin of bad theology. And because I disagree with them, that somehow that puts them on the outside of receiving the same grace that I have. And so what do I do? I go to the people who will believe, and I avoid the people who don't believe, just like Paul does in this text, right? No, that's not what Paul's doing. It may look like that on the surface. Paul's just saying, hey, I, I'm going to the Gentiles. These phony Jews, they're unbelief. I'm done with them. But notice, this is the end of the book of Acts, and Paul, is, Paul already knows the Jews don't believe, and yet he's still going to them because he's convinced that there are some. There are some Jews who will believe, and there are some Gentiles who will believe. What does that mean? This means that Paul doesn't just go, he doesn't have the courage to just go to people because he believes the gospel is for all nations. Paul genuinely believes that there are guaranteed people in all these nations who will believe, and some who won't believe. And so because he's convinced that there are some, though, who will believe, he wants to go, and he has the courage to bring the gospel there. As I've read the book of Acts anew, this sermon series, I'm convinced that what set the church on fire, what caused the early church to outlast and thrive during the Roman Empire was because of the reconciling power of Jesus Christ. The, the ancient world just did not have an answer for Romans and Jews and Gentiles all coming under one roof, proclaiming that they belong to Jesus. They, they have one Savior who is Jesus Christ the Lord. And people in the ancient world were so compelled by this that they said, hey, if that's what Jesus does, then I want to be a part of it. If that's who Jesus is, I want to follow him. And City Light, this still works today. Last week, we gathered in Midtown Crossing, and 68 people, all different kinds of people got baptized. You had kids, you had husbands, you had college students, you had poor, you had rich, you had religious, you had non-religious, you had big city, you had small city, but they all got into those baptism tanks declaring that they have one Savior, who is Jesus Christ. And part of the reason we do this outside in Midtown Crossing is so that all those people who live in those apartments, all the people in the city of the Omaha might come by and peer in and be so compelled to say, oh, if that's what Jesus does, I want to be a part of it. If that's who Jesus is, I want to follow him. And so City Light, we're going to need courage for this because this is going to make all of us uncomfortable. It means that all different kinds of people 
we, if we want all different kinds of people in our city to hear about Jesus, it's been promised to Paul, and that promise extends to us that there's going to be people from all nations who are going to gather here. It's going to rattle our sense of comfort. It's going to rattle our security of what we want our church to be. It means that we're going to have the courage, going to have to have the courage to break out of our ignorance, to go and get some, find somebody that we don't know at all that comes from a different walk of life and learn from them and listen to them and hear their story that we might see an opportunity to share the gospel with them. It means that we're going to need to gather here on Sunday morning and raise hands and declare our love for Jesus standing next to somebody who has a completely different political viewpoint than us, but what binds us together is Jesus. It means that we're going to have to scatter every week in city groups with people that don't have hobbies and aren't in our life stage, but what binds us is our unity in Jesus. If we have the courage to do this, I am convinced there are some in Omaha and beyond who will believe in the gospel. Do you know what the number one reason is people don't believe in the gospel? It's Christians. Christians who refuse to love one another and are selfish. But do you know what the number one reason is people do believe in Jesus? It's also Christians. Christians who love one another, forgive each other when they're selfish, and they seek the welfare of others, especially those that are different. So we have to have the courage for all kinds of people. We have to have the courage to lay down our fears of losing our dreams of what the church could be and enter into a gospel proclaiming people who share the good news of Jesus with all kinds of people so that the church can be what it should be. Amen? The last reason we can take courage that we can learn from Paul is this. Take courage because the gospel is always advancing. Take courage because the gospel is always advancing. Acts chapter 28, the last two verses says this. He, that's Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Here's the last verses in the book of Acts. And I'll, I'll admit, the book kind of just ends abruptly. What happened to Paul? Like, why haven't we heard about Peter in, like, forever? What happened to the other apostles? Did these early churches make it? The book of Acts never answers those questions. And verse 31 just simply says the gospel advances without hindrance. It's kind of an ironic statement because the gospel always advances, and especially when there is hindrance, it seems to advance even more. But I think the book ends this way so that we don't get caught up in one particular person like Peter or Paul, that we don't get caught up in one particular church like the Church of Jerusalem or the Church of Antioch. It's so that we get caught up in what the book of Acts has all been about, and that's the gospel advancing. If you remember in Acts 1.8, Jesus says to the disciples that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And this kind of acts as a table of contents for the book. Right? You see the gospel go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to Rome. Rome is not the end of the earth. Rome is like the center of the earth. It's the most popular city in the world. What is Luke doing here? Well, I think what he's doing is there's a well-known phrase about Rome that says this, all roads lead to Rome. Or let me put it to you this way. You can get to the ends of the earth through Rome. In other words, if the gospel can make it in Rome, it can make it to the ends of the earth. And the reason it just cuts off here is to show us that Acts is still going on. The reason it cuts off here is so that we will see our place in the book of Acts, that it's not over, that the mission of the gospel advancing still continues on through us. City Light, let's have courage to complete what God has set us out to do, to multiply disciples and churches. Do you realize we are immortal until our job is done of advancing the gospel and passing it on to the next generation or until Jesus comes back. You and I can never be failures in God's kingdom because the gospel always advances. When I was being interviewed to come to City Light, I only had one reason for not coming. And it was fear. It was fear. It was like, are you kidding me? Come work with my mentor, Gavin, who taught me everything I know and basically helped plant this church. Work alongside Chris Horuska, who has preaching skills and leadership that I'll never achieve. Work alongside Joe, who's an amazing pastor and counselor. Work alongside Phil, who can evangelize these amazing worship leaders. Papa Jack, who knows like the entire Bible. 
Are you kidding me? What role would I have to play here? What could I possibly have to offer on this team? I was terrified to be surrounded by people that seemed to be so gifted at advancing the gospel. But you know what caused me to have the courage to go in spite of my fears of insecurity? It's the fact that the gospel was advancing. It's the fact that the gospel was advancing. And I knew deep down in my soul that whatever happened in my life, what I wanted at the end of my life wasn't a, wasn't a story of all of the accomplishments that I had done. Notice Paul didn't get that. What I wanted was to say that the gospel advanced. That at the end of my life, it was all about the gospel advancing. We can have courage because God is faithful, because of the hope of the resurrection, because the gospel is for all kinds of people, and because it's always advancing. Let's pray. Jesus, as we come to a close here at the end of the book of Acts, I pray that we would be a people of courage, that we would take the gospel into all of our life's circumstances, that we would understand that you are faithful to be with us and to complete what you have started, that we can have a hope in the resurrection to not only stand up in any situation that we're facing, but to declare that hope to others. God, that we are a church that is for all kinds of people because you want to save all kinds of people. Would we give up our fears of, insecure, of comfort, our fears of losing comfort, our fears of losing our security so that the church can be truly your bride? And God, would we pray, pray, pray that the gospel would advance and would you use us to be a part of that? It's in your son's mighty name that I pray. Amen.